welcome to the next lesson in our series on lithosphere. This time, we will be talking about mining and the environment. By now, we have a fairly good idea of what is involved when we extract and refine different minerals. But what impact does this have on our environment? We've seen how people have benefited through the ages from these activities. Our wealth of minerals means that mining has brought employment, economic growth and development to South Africa. But we pay a price. In this lesson, we will explore some of the negative effects that mining industry has had on the environment and consider what can be done about this. Until recently, South Africa was not too focused on the environmental controls on the mining industry. However, our constitution says that all of us are entitled to an environment that promotes good health and that the government has a responsibility to make that happen. Mining and the processes used to extract minerals from the ore damage our environment in a number of ways. Changes to the land itself are clear. Even where mining happens underground, crushed rock is dumped after the valuable minerals have been extracted from it. Dumps are really ugly features of the landscape and they are found all over our gold, coal and other mining areas. The land can be rehabilitated to some extent when mining activities end. Although this goes a long way, such rehabilitation does not always restore the diversity of plant and animal life that has been disrupted. Let's listen to Kiki's interview with Professor Harold Anagon. Professor, thanks so much for meeting with us. Could you tell us about the main ways in which the mining industry impacts negatively on the environment? The process of mining inherently is an interference with the natural environment. Initially there would be a shaft going down into the earth and then horizontal shafts to access the mineral uh, bearing ore and in the process of bringing that solid material out from the bowels of the earth to the surface you've got your first major opportunity for disturbance of the natural environment. The first the disturbance to the earth itself, the solid earth, the cavities that we create which can create earth tremors, sinkholes. The disturbances of the earth include what we call subsidence. If these uh, shafts underneath the mound are quite close to the surface there's a possibility that the surface itself could collapse and cause a surface damage. This is particularly uh, so in coal mines which are generally shallower than gold mines and if you fly over an area of uh, previously mined by coaling it looks like a dimple, like a golf ball where little squares of the earth have sunk down up, sometimes up to two or three meters. The other disturbance to the surface of the earth can occur in coal mining if the underground coal catches fire. If you've got a, a burning fire underneath consuming the coal, it can eventually allow the earth to collapse. The material brought to the surface is a residue, which we call mine tailings, which can be either mine dumps or slime dams. So the prime in environmental concern then is managing this huge pile of solid waste which is generated from the mining process. Now the solid waste can interact both with the water, with the air and leak the solid material out into the environment. So I'd now like to turn to the aspect of air pollution uh, impacts of mining and that can be the gases from the underground fires and if that is near a community it can be very serious. Uh, in Witbank, a uh, fire was burning for about 15 years uh, in the uh, mid-80s, uh, late 70s, mid-80s, before they managed to put the fire out. In addition to uh, the, the fire, of uh, people who are living on the Witwatersrand are of course familiar with the dust from the gold mine tailings. Up until the mid-70s, it was terrible to live anywhere near the mine dumps. That was why the southern suburbs were not very popular places to live. Uh, and then some uh, very clever uh, horticulturalists managed to find a formula to enable grass to be planted on the dumps, cover the surface so that the wind could no longer blow the sand off. But then in the early 80s, somebody discovered there was still, still some gold left behind and said, oh, oh, we would like to get that gold out. And they started remining the, the dumps it's gold from waste, but in the process of excavating the mine dumps, they took away the vegetation. That dust 
is uh, often made of silica, which is not a very nice form of dust. It can cause damage to the lungs, so that is a further environmental damage, if you like, the damage to human health. And the good news is that if the mine manages the process properly by spraying with water or chemicals to keep the dust down, it is possible, even while they're mining, to uh, reduce the nuisance. And of course, what do you do with the leftovers from the mining? Oh, it's got to go somewhere else. Yep. So they're now making new mega dumps. Right? <laughs> As we have mega stores and mega malls, mm -hmm. we now have mega dumps. But these mega dumps are properly controlled. And as they build the dump up, they plant new grass on it and keep the top surface wet. And this largely reduces the dust. But there are other problems with the dumps. For instance, cyanide is a matter of concern. They use cyanide to extract gold, and there's a little bit of cyanide left in the sand when it is put onto the dump, and that cyanide can evaporate into the atmosphere. It's a very low quantity, but people are right to be concerned about it. Similarly, uh, bringing this material up from the surface of the earth brings other heavy metals, such as mercury, to the surface, and there's currently a lot of scientific interest about the whole cycle of mercury, because mercury concentrates into biological systems, eventually into fish, and if humans eat the fish, then the mercury gets into our bodies as well. Something which is of concern in the Witwatersrand is radioactivity. The gold mine ore, which is normally very deep under the ground, several thousand feet, has got a higher concentration of uranium and thorium. These are radioactive elements. If they're down in the rock, there's no environmental problem. But you bring the uh, ore to the surface, you grind it up very finely, and this radioactivity can escape into the environment, either the water or the air, and uh, that is a matter of concern. The element that is most concern deriving from uranium is an element called radon which is a gas, and as a gas it can escape out of the mine dump and get into the surroundings. So you can see that the dump of sand, which looks quite solid, uh, is actually breathing. It is releasing materials into the atmosphere in various ways. Now, strictly speaking, if this mine dump is well designed, it should never allow any water to escape. Even the rainfall should fall onto the dump and not flow off the dump. Uh, all around the foot of the, the dump is a tow dam and channels which allow the water to go to a lowest point and from that lowest point the water is pumped back onto the top of the dam where it can evaporate. That is the ideal, but as anybody who's lived on the Witwatersrand knows, uh, often these dams are not well constructed or they're not well maintained and water can leak out of these dumps into the streams. And characteristic of these streams, you see beautiful clear water and a yellow color on the bottom. Yes, I've seen that water. What is happening there is that water is very acidic. It is react the water is reacted with uh, iron pyrite. It's a mineral in the sand. The iron pyrite is iron sulfide, and the sulfur gets oxidized, and eventually you get the formation of sulfuric acid. The sulfuric acid reduces the pH of the water and kills off all the little organisms, the algae and the hochos and the crabs that live in the water. So the water looks beautifully clean and wouldn't you like to drink that because who likes to drink green slimy water? <laughs> but clear water is not healthy water for the environment. The way that this can be controlled is either to rebuild the, the tow dams or in the case of very old dumps, Actually removing the dump altogether and building a new well-designed dump is a way that that problem is going to be solved. What happens to the water with all the dissolved acid and all the dissolved heavy metals? Well, here is another good news story. Um, the water flowing south into, for instance, a clip sprite which flows past the wetter, the wetlands are full of reeds. And uh, these reeds trap the impurities um, in their roots and purify the water, and by time, the time the water flows out the other side of the reed beds, the acidity is removed and the heavy metals are deposited. The heavy metals, of course, can't disappear completely. They're trapped in the mud at the bottom of the reeds, what we call peat, and these peat beds 
are thousands of years old so that the metal is well and truly trapped so it cannot easily be released back into the environment where it could possibly make its way into the human system. We've heard a lot about how the mining industry damages the land and pollutes water systems and the air, but is there any good news? Well, the, the good news is that under the new mining legislation, the mining companies have taken a great responsibility to reduce the impacts of these, uh, these various components, starting with the amendments to the Mines Act in uh, 1990. Each of the mines took responsibility for developing an environmental management plan. They could employ their own consultants or their own staff and they drew up a plan and they submitted this to the government. Could you give us some of the main strategies that mining companies are required to put in place by law to minimize the negative impacts of their activities on the environment? Well, the uh, emissions of dust from the Witwatersrand controlled firstly by water spraying if they are in operating sections and by covering with vegetation. There's a very exciting development uh, from the University of the Witwatersrand on developing trees that can grow on these mine dumps. And now if you put a tree on a mine dump, the tree has got much deeper roots so that even if there's a couple of years of drought, the tree will survive and the tree soaks up water from the sand so it prevents it from uh, leaking out and the vegetation slows down the wind and prevents the dust blowing away and so that this development of developing vegetation trees that will cover these mine dumps so instead of having a huge heap of ugly sand with dust and polluted water flowing you'll have a little forest so what factors would encourage or disencourage mines from complying with these regulations? Well, obviously the, the cost of rehabilitation is uh, it's quite expensive. For instance, it costs between five and 10,000 rand per hectare to put grass on a mine dump. And you can make a very good bowling green or golf course for 10,000 rand per hectare. And uh, so the costs are um, quite considerable and the difficulty is if, uh, if it's an old mine or a mine that's already closed down, who's going to pay? Mm -hmm. And um, the government takes responsibility. If they can't find the owner, then the government sends in their engineers or consultants to, to uh, fix up the dumps. But this is quite controversial. The government can't do everything for us. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of old and abandoned mine dumps. And that's one of the big challenges is the abandoned mine workings and, uh, and tailings. Um, who monitors that they are complying with these regulations and how effective is this monitoring? Well, in, under the old days, the uh, Department of Minerals and Energy had a group of inspectors who had to go and inspect all these mines. And it was a very difficult task because there were few inspectors and many mines. <laughs> under the new legislation, the companies have a contract with the go government to include the environmental management as part of their operations. So it is a much more cooperative arrangement. The most important inspectors though are you <laughs> and me. Of course. Because under the new constitution we have a right to a clean and healthy environment. And under the old legislation if you went to court or to a lawyer they said nobody may question the minister and nobody may question the mine, you've got no standing. Mm -hmm. Under the new constitution, it's inclusive, it gives the individuals rights. So essentially you become, have the whole population helping to look after the environment. So it's much more difficult for a rogue mine owner to get away with it as he could in the past. So Professor, are there any strategies that you feel should be more widely practiced in the mining industry to minimize its negative impacts? One of the bigger challenges is in the control of water from the mine tailings and it really is very difficult for these old mine tailings the removal of the dumps is the only ultimate sure way to prevent uh, a failure. We have another very very ugly legacy from mining and that's with asbestos. Um, it is a sad fact that uh, the dangers of asbestos were concealed from the population by the previous governments and the previous owners of the asbestos companies and unfortunately asbestos is not something that you can easily chemically treat to make it go away and even if you put vegetation on dumps uh, 
there's a possibility that asbestos can escape from the dumps. We still need to, uh, I believe, spend more money on consolidating the asbestos dumps and educating communities about the danger. Thank you, KK. Professor Onegon has certainly highlighted many of the problems that mining causes in the environment. Great Elevens, you may have first-hand experience of some of these yourself. So, what do you think about the benefits of extracting minerals from the lithosphere compared to the problems it causes? You'll find more information on our website www.mindset.co.za forward slash learn. Until next time, goodbye.